Uh, John is co-founder, president, and CEO of Complagen, a really interesting uh, technology you have in your company, John. I've been having a little wander around the internet looking at it, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this talk. <laughs> well, I want to thank Larry for inviting me and Chris for helping me to get here. Um, and I also want to say that already with the conference, I've had two issues. Um, one is I woke up this morning and I thought, what the hell is I doing when I make it? titled my talk and, and, and how am I going to deal with that. Second is, is when you sit and listen to three or four talks that are fairly engaging, you begin to think, forget about what you're going to talk about and how you're going to do it, which then exacerbates the first problem, which is what the hell am I going to do with this title. Um, so we're going to make a complete switch. Uh, I'm not uh, going to talk to you very much about microbiology at all. And I'm going to probably say some things will offend some people in the audience, and some things will offend other people in the audience, and hopefully there will be an overlap of people that I don't offend, and, um, and, and we'll have some good questions at the end. Um, the closest I'm going to come, if I can work this thing, to microbiology is the second slide. Um, and this isn't what I'm going to talk about. Oops, I'm sorry. Shoot. See, I can't even work the darn... What happened here? This isn't what I'm going to talk about, but it is why I'm going to talk to you about what is the subject of the seminar. And I spent a, a long portion of my career um, working with uh, parasitic protozoa that cause disease in the third world. And there are two issues with, well, there are multiple issues with parasitic disease in the third world, but uh, one of the major ones is a socioeconomic issue, and, and that is that people are poor. Um, and when people are poor, we tend not to develop drugs for those populations because we can't make money off the drugs. And I should, in Chris Walsh said, say I am a 100% meat-eating capitalist. So I do clearly have an interest in Competent Incorporated. We are trying to develop drugs. Um, but nonetheless, why am I talking about these, 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 this image up here on the, on, the, on the screen? The reason is that two things. This is, a, this is a trypanosome. God darn it, I keep trying to hit the... It is an IQ test, and I'm failing it miserably. This is a trypanosome. It's a single cell. It's a single cell protozoan that affects humans. Related trypanosomes affect animals. Most mammals are, are infected by some form of trypanosome. I happen to work with this one. It's called trypanosoma cruzi. And we did basic science. We learned how the, the, how the organisms express genes, how they organize genes, how they transcribed RNA, how they process that RNA. Um, as part of that, I sat around in a lot of meetings with a lot of parasitologists over a 15 to 20 year period and listened to all of them, including myself, talk about how we understood this parasite and we knew what, it, what was the perfect target for drug development. And about 15 minutes after that, you'd realize it's a single cell bloody parasite, but we really don't understand it at all. So the arrogance of a scientist led us to believe that we could understand it well enough to develop drugs which are targeted at particular proteins within that parasite. But the truth is, it's incredibly complicated, as Larry pointed out in his first talk. And we really don't understand, after all these years, the first thing about it, if one wants to go about drug development. And I think that's very well pointed out, because there hasn't really been a new drug for a parasitic disease in my lifetime. That's almost true. I'm getting old. The guy up above is... Uh, the, the beetle that transmits Chagas disease. And it's even more complicated. We know nothing about that. So what, what do we do to, to control Chagas disease right now? Probably the most effective thing is to spray and, and eliminate the, the insects. So um, the next thing that came in the field of parasites that, that, that kind of drove me to doing drug discovery was I sat in meetings and I helped organize some of the genome projects for the parasitic protozoan. And so this is in the early to mid-90s. And everybody thought that if we would sequence the genomes of these parasites, this would be a great thing. And somehow that would lead to effective drugs with parasites. And I was in a meeting in uh, Buenos Aires and sitting with people I won't name. And we were having this grand discussion, a uh, WHO-funded meeting. And we, at the end of the meeting, I asked, well, what the heck are we going to do with the information once, you ha once, we've once we've defined the sequence? And everybody looked at me with completely empty eyes. 
And it dawned on me that nobody had even thought about this. So, see, so sequencing seemed like a good thing. It seemed like a good thing at the time. But nobody had thought about what you're going to do with it. I think, to a certain degree, the same could be said at that time with the human genome sequencing, is that we're going to drive a lot of technology, we're going to generate the sequence of a lot of nucleic acid, but exactly how is it going to benefit drug development uh, was a little bit unclear at the time. I think it's become more clear as time has gone on. But there is a lot of the philosophy, I'd say it's sort of like, you know, if you build it, they'll come. If we generate the information, it will, it will, it will generate an enthusiasm, generate technologies that allow people to make use of that and then develop drugs. And that's been true in some cases, but not enough. It's, it, I think it's been fairly sparing. It's been true that it's developed and I think promoted basic science tremendously. Um, and I think one has to completely separate those two things. Um, there's basic science where we under, try to understand how cells work, how organisms work, and that's a certain endeavor that's, that's funded by the government, um, and we should never stop doing that. It's one of the strengths of the United States, I think, historically, has been our willingness to figure out the sex life of a fruit fly. Um, on the other hand, there's another part of that, which is we need to, do, we need to develop drugs not only for parasitic disease, but for all the diseases and maladies that we are afflicted with. Um, in terms of parasitic disease, the major issue, as I said, is cost. Well, that's an issue with diseases of the developed world as well. And so I sit around, um, maybe with some of you in the audience, I, I absolutely with some of you in the audience today, and decided that, well, if we can't understand, damn it, excuse me, if we can't, and I'm failing that test, if we can't understand a single, a simple single-celled parasite and how it works, and we can't develop a drug against that, how are we going to develop drugs in a rational way against human disease, uh, non-infectious disease? And, and I think the simple answer that we came up with, which is only partially true, is we won't take the rational approach. So let's take rational, the irrational approach to science and largely throw it out the window and try to develop a system where the discovery system will tell you what's important. And that might help us define targets that are of interest in, in terms of uh, drug development. And then if we take that a step further and we say we can use this kind of a technology or kind of an approach to identify targets that might be of interest, can we use the same rationale to say let's not try to identify and presuppose what are the best chemical structures from which to build a drug, but let's just let the system tell us what those structures are. And this is nothing terribly new to the people that have done a lot of uh, small molecule drug discovery. Um, but we'll see how we've, how we've approached it over the years. So I am going to spend a fair amount of time describing to you how and why we do what we do. And, and I'm going to show you, I think, two or three examples at the end that has just enough data in it to, I hope, convince you that we actually can do it. And, and, and along the way, uh, maybe point out some of the benefits of this. So, we're not going to work with parasites anymore, and I hit it twice. And we're actually going to talk about a kind of small molecule inhibitor. Now, what do I mean by small molecule? I, I don't have any pictures of a small molecule. I have very few pretty pictures. But, but a small molecule is something that's very similar to what Chris Wall showed you in terms of the antibiotics, but it's a little simpler. It's just carbons, hydrogens, phosphates, sulfurs, linked in certain ways. And the thing about small molecules is there, I think, and there will, there will be a chemist in the office, audience who is going to correct me, I, so please don't, um, because I know I'm wrong. <laughs> but in terms of chemical space, how many different small molecules can one make? It's something like 10 to the 40th, I think, fills up, theoretically fills up chemical space. That is a massive, massive, massive number. So we can't interrogate that many molecules. So we have to work with what we have and then have a system which pulls from within a collection of molecules those that are reasonably important and hopefully somewhat unique in how they interact with a target and inhibit that target. So the types of molecules that we've been working with are molecules which inhibit a function of a cell, I'm, I'm sorry, they inhibit a function within a cell, but they inhibit a function of a target, but they don't inhibit it by blocking its functional activity, or what we would say is its catalytic activity. Um, 
Rather, we identify molecules which, for example, block where a protein target goes within itself to carry out a function. Now, what's the nice thing about that? Well, the nice thing about that is protein targets have multiple functions within itself. Sometimes proteins carry out functions uh, at the cytoplasmic membrane, which is the exterior, inside of the exterior of the cell. That same protein may carry out a function in the cytoplasm. It may also carry out a, a function within the nucleus of the cell, where the DNA is. And in some cases, it may even carry out a function in the mitochondria. And if you just simply take a sledgehammer and inactivate the catalytic activity of that protein uh, product, you're going to inhibit all of those. And I think to some degree, that's some of the reason we've seen a relatively slow development of drugs with small molecules, because you have these toxic, off, unexpected side effects of small molecules, and it's because you're inhibiting them across the board in, in, in the cell and in all cells in the body. So we are, are I'm going to talk to you about what we refer to as allosteric inhibitors. They are really inhibitors of allosteric regulation. Um, and I would like to say we were really, really insightful and brilliant when we set up this system to identify these allosteric inhibitors. But the truth is that it's simply something that the system told us it was important, and we were... We were intelligent enough, I think, to recognize it, but the system wasn't designed specifically to do this. But the important outcome of the system is that we identify these with relative ease. So, identification of allosteric inhibitors, xenogene technology, that's just what we call it. Don't worry about that. Um, so how do these assays work that we use? So, I guess a bit of microbiology. We use a very simple organism to do this. These are all cellular assays. People have done this for a very long time. We use Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, single-celled single -celled organism. The beautiful thing, having now denigrated all the genome projects, the beautiful thing about the, about the, the genome of Saccharomyces cerevisiae is it's been sequenced and every gene's been identified. We know which genes are essential, which genes aren't essential. We pretty much know what they do. Uh, we know a lot about it. So we can use it as a sink within which we can put a human therapeutic target and have it function in a predictable way within that yeast strain. And what we can really do is generate yeast cells, which by and large, a collection of yeast cells, hundreds or thousands in size, which by and large are genetically identical, but each one within this group depends upon a different human therapeutic target for its ability to grow. Very, very simple. 50, 100-year-old science. And because each one of these are identical, except each de depends on a different therapeutic target for their ability to grow, we can take this collection of yeast strains and interrogate a small molecule library to find compounds which selectively inhibit only one of those strains but no others. And by and large, when we do that, we find that those molecules are very selective for the target. And that's what I'm going to show you here in the next few slides. And as I said uh, at the end down here, these, the ones that are very highly selective invariably turn out to be inhibitors of allosteric regulation. They're not these molecules that inactivate the basic core function of the target. They, they, they alter its compartmentalization, they block its compartmentalization, they block its association with other molecules the cell has to interact, the target has to interact with, etc. Well, that's a good point. Sorry, that's jargon. Allosteric, allosteric regulation. Things can be, targets, proteins can be regulated in a number of ways in the cell. They can be regulated by how they're transcribed, when they're transcribed, how highly they're transcribed. So you make messenger RNA. So a level of, level of regulation is a level of transcription, translation of R, the DNA into messenger RNA. They can, be they can then be subsequently regulated by how well they're trans translated. That RNA is turned into a protein. Um, you can then also regulate them by how active that catalytic site is. Uh, if you're talking about a molecule which transfers a phosphate from, uh, to a target, you may have to bind a molecule like ATP to that target. And so it can be regulated by the, the efficiency with which ATP binds or doesn't bind. There are all kinds of ways you can regulate proteins. Um, but when you get to the protein level, and, you're, and if you're inhibiting the active side of the protein, you're simply turning that protein off. Allosteric regulation, on the other hand, is there are other parts of a protein, we call them domains, they have different names, 
that are responsible for uh, compartmentalization, as they say. And what that means is, how does a protein get from one point to another point? Or how does a protein assume a, a particular three-dimensional structure which blocks its activity? Or in another case, that three-dimensional structure, three structure is altered, so the, so the protein becomes active. And it's these non-active site inhib inhibitions of the protein target that Larry has referred to, re Larry has referred to as allosteric regulation, and I have as well. So they're, they're, they are non-active site inhibitors that block different processes that are important for the activity of the protein, but they're not, the, they themselves blocking the activity, the functional activity of that protein. Okay. So how do we do this? This is a cartoon, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a really simple cartoon. Let's, as an example, um, what we do is, as I said, we have collections of these yeast strains. This is a if we take two of these yeast strains, and let's say these two carry two molecules, they're protein kinase, it's called AKT1 and AKT3. Each of these yeast strains, this strain depends upon the function, and that's important, they depend upon the function of AKT1 for its ability to grow. This one totally depends upon the function of AKT3 for its ability to grow. Now this thing in the middle here, that represents a small molecule library. In our case, we, we screen about a quarter of a million compounds. It's a small number. Pharma companies will screen 10 times that. Um, but we simply take these two strains and we interrogate this small molecule library, put these things in the, in the incubator overnight and come back the next day and ask what happened. And most of the time, what happens is nothing. That's these yellow circles here. Compounds had no effect whatsoever on the growth of the strains. They have, so those compounds, the, and that's the vast majority of compounds, 98% of the compounds have no effect whatsoever. We will find a few compounds which are represented by these white circles that inhibit all of our strains. Now the important thing in yeast is there are 1,251 proteins in yeast that are absolutely essential for its ability to grow. So if a compound inhibits any one of those 1,251, all of the yeast strains die. Well, we throw that out. We don't really, but for today, we throw that out because that's a compound but if we put it into an animal cell, it may very well inhibit 15 different targets, and we don't want that. We'll find a subset of compounds, much smaller in number, where they'll inhibit only one of these, say the AKT1 strain, but not the AKT2, or the AKT3 dependent strain. And these are compounds that we're interested in, and compounds that we take forward, analyze, and move into animal cells, into animal models. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about that. So I'm going to take this, this, this talk, by the way, just to prepare you for it, is going to stop right after discovery. I'm not going to take this through drug development. This is really focused on drug discovery, per se. So this is the machine. I won't spend, a lot of I won't spend hardly any time on it, but basically, it's a, it's a discovery machine which allows you to use yeast to interrogate a library and generate candidates, drug, these are small molecule drug candidates, which we or others can then, we hopefully, can it hopefully at some point develop into to useful drugs this is important only for one reason, and, and the reason it's important is the system is quick enough and fast enough that a small team can do an incredible amount of work. Um, we can virtually match a major pharmaceutical company and the number of assays and molecules and selectively active molecules that we identify, and you'll see on the last slide, we're a very, very small group. The timelines for us are very, very short from assay development to mid preclinical development. Why is that important? That's important because if we're thinking about the cost of healthcare and delivering healthcare, you know, every year you can add on to the back end of a patent is a big deal. So on the front end, you know, this may seem small and trivial, but I think on the back end, if we can shorten the timeline for uh, development of a drug and, and taking a drug to market by a single year, that's a huge amount of money and a huge amount of cost. So that's the machine. Uh, we won't spend time on it. Um, capacity, people are always worried about capacity. Yeast is a single cell organism, has a small genome. How many, how many human targets can we represent? The answer to the question in simple terms is we're not limited by targets. We can represent several thousand targets uh, in, this, in this system that we can use to, do, to uh, identify selectively active compounds. So it's a very facile system, it's a broadly applicable system, and you can tell I'm not focused, I haven't focused at all on cancer or inflammation or obesity or anything else. The, you know, the platform will address many, many different therapeutic areas. Is there anything else I wanted to say? I guess this is kind of telling you that 
one of the things that we wanted to look at is the spectrum of, of functions that carry on, are carried out in a yeast cell compared to a human cell and how well do we represent those. They're represented very well. That's the short answer. Oops. Um, this slide, I'm not going to go over it. This is a part, part of the pipeline we generated over the last couple of years um, to identify. These are, again, small molecule uh, compounds for the specific targets. They're all listed here, and they can be applied in a variety of different areas. Some of these targets and the inhibition of these targets apply to multiple therapeutic areas. They may be applicable for oncology or inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's fascinating. It works. So example number one, um, AKTs. We wanted to know a long time ago, and um, there are some people in the audience, I know Lex is sitting up here, um, they are much more knowledgeable with AKT than I am. And, um, but we started, nonetheless, it's always good to jump into the lion's den, I guess. What's this slide mean? You don't have to read it. Don't expect you to read it. But what the slide is, is the representation of the amino acid sequence. That's the sequence of amino acids in the proteins for the three AKTs. These are AKTs 1, 2, and 3. They're very, very similar. And up here's the question, where do you look? So one of the ways that you can do drug discovery is try to divine from this sequence what's the best place to look, what's the least homologous. If I want to inhibit only AKT1, I could go to the least homologous region between, or the least similar region between these three uh, molecules and say, well, this is the place to focus. So I'm going to focus all my efforts on this area, or I'm going to focus all my efforts right here. Or if I'm, if I'm really silly, I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to focus on the catalytic site and generate a molecule that's going to be completely useless. This has been done a lot. Maybe it's the majority of efforts. Um, is looking at the catalytic sites because they're easy. Um, but places, where wouldn't you look? Well, you wouldn't look right here. There's a little bit of difference there, but there's not a lot of difference there. Well, if we have these strains and we screen the library, we can, let the, we can let the strains and the chemistry tell us what's important. And at the end of the day, what they tell us is that amino acid is important right there. And that's what we need, and that's all we need to have a selective inhibitor of AKT1. So this is just saying, in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of that. Uh, very highly select. Actually, I don't know if it's the next slide or the one after that. So this is where I'm going to upset some. Yeah, no, let me go back. Um, and the next slide is going to show you that what an AKT1 selective inhibitor looks like. And I'm going to compare it to another very good molecule <laughs> that's in development in the clinic, much, much more further developed. And, and it's called MK2206. It's a Merck compound. Um, it's, it's been developed over a number of years. Um, I'm not going to guess how much money you guys have put into that. Uh, and it's in a multitude of uh, clinical trials right now, both by itself and in combination with other things. It's a very good molecule. Um, so what we did was take our yeast strains that are dependent upon AKT, AKTs 1, 2, and 3, and then a number of other kinases that are kind of common off targets you don't want to inhibit, and ask, this AKT inhibitor, MK2, I'm sorry, I went one forward there. This, MK, this AKT inhibitor, MK2206, how selective is it, and does it inhibit anything other than AKTs 1 or 2, et cetera? And what we find out using our yeast cell, our yeast strains, is that MK2206 is a bloody good inhibitor. It inhibits AKT1. To a lesser degree, it inhibits AKT2. That's the uh, green line here. And it's a little less active on AKT3. Um, and then these other kinases, you know, you really don't get to any activity until you're really pretty high in concentration. So that's a good molecule. I really think it's a good molecule. Um, then we have a molecule called CGX19, and we're looking at the same subset of kinase assays in our yeast strains um, and a couple of others. And this molecule inhibits AKT1, but it's flat on everything else we've tested it against. So it's, it's very, very selective for AKT1. And so the question was, why the heck is that so? And uh, because we knew that if we were, gonna inhibit, if we were inhibiting the catalytic site, and at this point, this is now too many years ago, um, we didn't think it would be that, that selective. So what we did was, what was, this is just to prove that it works. In yeast cells, it inhibits phosphorylation of AKT1, but not 2 and 3. What we did is we went back and used genetics again. So this was sort of littered with genetics along the way. And so what we decided to do was because we had a strain, a, a gene, a protein that was sensitive, AKT1, and we had another one, AKT3, which was resistant, that we could make recombinance between these two. So that means taking pieces of AKT 
uh, one and putting them into three, or AKTs three and putting them into one, and see if we could change the sensitivity of the protein target to the compound. And after doing that quite a bit, what we found was we could take a small region here, dark, re represented in dark blue, and if we took this region and put it into AKT3, um, what would happen is, that's actually shown here, is this purple line. So normally AKT3 here is here. So not the greatest experiment, but it's not bad. And it's insensitive to the compound's inhibition. But if we, take, if we exchange this small region, AKT3 becomes completely sensitive to the compound. Conversely, if we take this region of AKT3 and put it into AKT1, AKT1, which is sensitive, becomes totally insensitive. And so that told us that, that the, we, we kind of knew where this compound was binding. It was outside the catalytic domain. And uh, not surprising, based on what I told you a minute ago, we were inhibiting a region. All we were doing really was exchanging four amino acids. And really comes down to exchanging uh, a deletion of a single amino acid between AKT2 and uh, one and three. And that's what's really driving selectivity. It's that simple. And if you had set out to do this from a rational approach, I don't think you ever would have gotten there. Okay. This is a slide. I'm stealing parts of it from a rabiopharma, a scientist at rabiopharma who co-crystallized a molecule which binds to AKT. Um, I, think in this, I think in this case it's AKT1. Um, I could be wrong about that. And if you're out there in the audience, you can tell me later. Um, the important thing here is that when crystallization, you take the target protein and you make, it, you make a solid crystal out of it. And one of the things you can do with crystallization is you can co-crystallize that protein with its inhibitor and ask, where does that inhibitor bind and what's important? What region of the protein is the inhibitor really binding to? And what we find is that you can define a small region that's important for the binding of this compound. And there is one in our series, which I'll tell you, which biotech companies never tell you, which looks a lot like this compound. And so when we compare the amino acids, which are important here, with what we define genetically, there's a very good overlap. So the genetics has told us, given us a certain answer about which amino acids are important for compound action. And it it's, it's overlaps with the crystal structure, but it's subtly different. And that's what we found every time we've done this. So that's AKT, AKTs 1, 2, and 3. You can expand this and say, what about the other related targets that people worry about, like uh, PKA, et cetera? And when you look at it, it's, it, maybe it's not surprising, but PKA c carries the same, because our compounds don't inhibit PKA. They carry that same deletion uh, relative to AKT1. So again, you know, w we developed a system so that we, we, could, we could have these isogenic yeast strains and then simply use those yeast strains to interrogate a large collection of chemistry. Ours is somewhat limited because we're a small company. And then characterize those compounds that had interesting characteristics that came out of it. Um, so that's one example. That just shows the kind of compounds we get and where they bind. Second example, of, again, we're in, I'm going to talk very briefly about autosteric inhibition. And I don't have a watch, so you're going to have to, you're going to wave, right? Um, I'm not going to talk to you too much about PKC theta. We have a large program in PKC theta, and PKC theta is an interesting target. It's involved in immunology, T cell lymphoma, a variety of things, inflammation. Um, HIV infection, and theta has been a, a very difficult target for people to get at. One of the reasons it's been difficult is because the vast majority, maybe all of the inhibitors of theta that I know of, um, are all inhibitors, that, they're that sledgehammer type inhibitor that binds to and inhibits the catalytic activity of the compound, the target, I'm sorry, meaning that it inhibits the activity of PKC theta in all compartments in the cell and in all cells in which it's expressed. Now, P, this, mall, this target is primarily expressed in T cells. That's its, it's, its, kind of its major location. For many years, it was thought to only be expressed in T cells. Well, that's not true. Every time you hear that, you can count on two years later, there'll be another cell type it's expressed in. Um, it's important in fibroblasts, and it's important in platelets as well, and there are others. And so an allosteric inhibitor here, which was not a catalytic inhibitor, we felt would have the probable possibility of inhibiting its T cell-specific functions, but not inhibiting its functions in platelets or fibroblasts, for instance. And so that's what I'm going to show you just a little bit of here. Um, and this is just a summary of, of the characteristics of these compounds. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But basically, the compounds that we've identified that selectively inhibit PKC theta. PKC theta is a member of a 14 protein family, I believe. There are seven members, I think it's seven members of novel PKCs. They're highly conserved. Uh, you don't want to inhibit 
uh, more than PK, if you don't have a broad inhibitor of the novel PKCs, this compound's selective. It inhibits the functions of T cells that we wanted to inhibit. It doesn't inhibit functions we didn't want to inhibit, which are B cell functions, so it's selectively inhibiting theta in a T cell. It doesn't inhibit PKC theta in a fibroblast, and it doesn't inhibit PKC theta in a platelet. It has no activity at all. It's the, the, the cells are totally immune to the compound. But it does inhibit PKC theta in a, in, in a, a T cell. Won't go over this. Same type of experiment, but again, we identified the compounds and we asked, where do they bind? Just naively asked, where do these compounds bind? And where all the compounds bind, they bind in a region called the V3 region. And the V3 region, why is the V3 region important? It's upstream of the kinase domain. What does it do? Well, one of the things that stopped that it does is on this slide. And this is a model um, developed at least in part, large part, by a fellow named Am Amnon Altman. And I'll show you, he's at the La Jolla Institute of Allergy and Immunity, I think it's called. Um, and this is a part of a large cytoplasmic com uh, complex called the immunologic synapse. And basically, when a T cell is confronted with a signal, there's an activation of what's called a T cell receptor, and that results in a chain of events which turn on a number of genes which are responsible for the, that part of the immune response. And that T cell, the formation of that T cell receptor involves several necessary steps. And one of those, a couple of those steps are association of this molecule, which is PKC theta, with this molecule, which is LCK, and this molecule, which is CD28. And it's via that association that CD28 basically tags PKC theta up to the immunologic synapse, and then PK, PC, PKC theta becomes stably inserted uh, via, via other domains. But what's important here is it's that V3 region that allows for the association of PKC theta with LCK. And so if we're inhibiting in the V3 region, we might have thought that our compounds are in fact going to inhibit translocation of the target to the immunologic synapse and hence block the activation of that T cell receptor, which is important in allergy, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. And all I'm going to tell you in this slide is because there's data on this slide, and, uh, and I could go over it with you if you want to uh, later. But basically, it's a, it's a part of a, a series of experiments that say, well, in fact, that's what's happening. Our, what our compounds are doing is blocking the, the, the formation of this complex and translocation of PKC theta, the immunologic synapse, and hence shutting down uh, intracellular signaling from the, the T cell receptor uh, through in a molecule called NF kappa B, which is a transcription factor which turns on the expression of a lot of different genes. And so it completely shuts down that, that arm of the process. Um, and again, so it's this, it's, a, it's this type of molecule that specifically inhibits the compartmentalization of the target rather than simply blowing the target up. Because if you blow the target up, you're going to inhibit all functions of the target. And many of the drugs we take, that's what's happening. I mean, the, the drugs are, are aimed again towards parts of the molecules which are easy to approach. And those tend to be catalytic sites. What do I put in here next? Um, so this just tells you what I've already told you. There are some effects of the molecule on other parts of the immune system that are interesting for the aficionados in the audience. It enhances the T regulatory cells. That's a good thing. So it turns down a certain part of the T cell system and it enhances another part of the T cell system. And it's all consistent with what's known based on the basic science of it that's been done over the last 30 years. And we've done this, and I have to say, we're not, I'm not an immunologist. And yet I can, I, I can generate these assays, I can generate these compounds, I can use these compounds to study the process and translate it into animal cells into animals. And um, so we, we can be sort of target and, 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 and therapeutic area agnostic. Um, we don't have to be married to immunology, we don't have to be married to oncology. But speaking of oncology, I want to show you one other example that I'm going to get out of your hair. Um, there is... Another one of these members of the same, you'll notice it's called PKC, protein kinase C, and it's a but it's what we call a different isotype, it's PKC delta. PKC delta has become, two minutes, very important in a type of cancers that are essentially totally untreatable. And what I would just like to say, and I won't even show you the data, is show you this slide. Um, there's, there are signaling cascades in cells, and these signaling cascades respond to signals, external signals, and turn on pathways, and turn on genes downstream, and when they get out of whack, you can have, a, you can have a, an oncogenic event, and you can get uncontrolled cell proliferation. And this is what happens in a normal cell. In a cell which, and, and RAS is unmutated here, in a cell which carries a RAS mutation, 
there's another protein that wasn't involved, and it's called PKC delta. And in that, this context, in the context of activating RAS mutation, PKC delta becomes completely essential for the, for, the, for the proliferation of most of these cell lines. This was discovered by a fellow named Doug Fowler at the University of Boston Medical School. And so we already had molecules, and we're working with PKC delta molecules, and we thought that might be interesting in terms of treating cancers, which are essentially totally untreatable. I mean, this, this represents, for example, 90% of pancreatic cancers, something like 50% of colorectal cancers, about 30 to 40% of non-small cell lung cancers, a smaller percentage of, of, of breast cancers. Um, it's a huge unmet need. I mean, with many of these things, if you're diagnosed, unless you have a surgical cure, you're going to die. And, and so there's, there's nothing that's really worked. I will say that I think the thing that's working the best are combination therapies with MK2206 and, and, and an AstraZeneca compound. But right now, there, I don't think there's really anything out there. And the, the, the short part of this story is go over that. These compounds work on all cell lines that carry an activating RAS mutation that we've tested uh, across the board. They are com basically completely silent on cells that don't carry a RAS mutation. So these compounds would, in theory, selectively target the tumorigenic cells that carry that activating RAS mutation. Forget that. They work in, they work in, they work in mice. They, they reduce the, the, the rate of growth of tumors in mice. And I'm going to skip over this last little part, but I'm going to show you the last slide because I'm out of time. We, did a, we wanted to see how, how complex is the protein profile. Can we generate biomarkers? We actually did a, a study in collaboration with Somologic here. And, and ask a simple question, if we treat RAS-dependent cells, so these are cells which have that activating RAS mutation, if we treat them with an inhibitor of delta, can we define a series of molecules which could be used both as a diagnostic to say, yes, you have, you're, carry, you're, you're expressing a tumor which carries an activating RAS mutation. And, and maybe more importantly, in drug development, we can use them as companion markers for develop of compounds through the clinic. Ultimately, we did this experiment. We looked at about a thousand, is Nick up here? We looked at about 1,000 analytes approximately, or that means 1,000 different proteins in cell culture supernatants uh, that were expressed, either in cells which carried, carried, oops, carried, carried a RAS mutation, these guys over here, or didn't. And this is, this, we're looking at, at, the, at, at the level of expression of a VEGFC. Don't worry about what it is. But this guy is selectively uh, uh, altered following treatment with a PKC delta inhibitor. And the interesting thing that comes out of this is that if we just, I'm going to go right down here. This is a more complicated one, but gets the story. These are non-small cell lung cancer cells, uh, two different cell lines. These are a pancreatic cell line. This, these three all carry an activating RAS mutation. This particular one is another non-small cell lung that does not carry an activating RAS mutation and is not sensitive to our compounds. So these three are all sensitive. And what we're looking at are the number of proteins that are changing in, this, in, in, the, uh, in the supernatant. And what we find is there are a large number that change. There's 200 and some here, 104 here, 92 here, smaller number over here. If we overlay this data, we actually come down out of all of these to only nine markers, nine proteins out of the thousand we started with that are conserved and consistent across the three different types of cells which carry this activating RAS mutation and vary with treatment of a PKC delta inhibitor. So it begins to give us this profile we're after to identify, uh, potentially at some point in time, identify patients who, who, who harbor tumors which, expressing, or which are expressing uh, an activating RAS mutation by some method other than biopsy and sequence, um, and begin treatment very early on. And hopefully, if it's not this compound, it will be some other compound that people develop that will selectively inhibit uh, these activated RAS-activated cells. And with that, I mean, I'm, I've kind of wandered a bit, but the whole point here is, is that, you know, you, you, we've taken both as kind of a non-rational approach to identifying what we think are important targets using the platform, and then using that, that, collection, of that collection of yeast strains, interrogated small molecule libraries to identify compounds that we might not have anticipated on the front end, which we certainly, certainly would not have anticipated, and have identified a collection which we think has unique, have a unique mode of action that will be uh, both potent and safe. And it's extensible. This is the small part of it. These are all the people up here in Compagent. You can see we're a very small group. Uh, Dean Dawson in the University of Oklahoma. Tony Marion's up here in the office. He keeps me straight in immunology. Um, Mary Rail is at the University of Colorado uh, School of Dental Medicine, and she's helped us with a lot of the KRAS studies. 
and then uh, Amnon Altman at the La Jolla Institute of Allergy and Immunology, and I got a some of the guys from Somalogic to help with the uh, biomarker study. So, thank you. So, John, thanks for that. I I'm going to take the only time I'm going to do this, moderator's uh, privilege, and ask you a question of my own if I, if I can. So your screen is uh, set up at the moment to find inhibitors, allosteric inhibitors. You could re-engineer it to find um, m other modulators, increased activity. That's right. And that would be really interesting because it's actually quite hard to screen for compounds that increase activity. And the, there are examples. So galantamine, for example claims to be an allosteric modulator, which increases activity. To be honest, I think that's probably of more use to the marketeers of galantamine yeah. than clinical efficacy, but it would be really interesting and useful to have a screen to increase activity. You, one can do that, and the reason we began where we did is because it's frankly easier, mm -hmm. a bit easier to do what we did than it is to engineer it to try to identify activators, but it can be done. Questions? Guy here, and keep your hands up if you. So, John, um, I'm not sure I understand the, the yeast system completely, but but you require that the allosteric regulation be conserved between yeast and human cells for the for the drug to make the jump. Is that correct? So, say if AKT1 oh, is, that is transported to a membrane yeah. by a given transport. I think the yeast requires it. I'm not sure we did. The yeast, the yeast requires that at least some portion of the allosteric regulation be maintained between the mammalian cell and the yeast cell. Um, um, I, truthfully, we hadn't thought that far ahead when we began working on this 12 years ago. But as it turns out, that's true. So I was curious uh, from your experience, <coughs> what percentage of uh, proteins, let's say there's 250,000 proteins in humans, right? So. What percentage is actually allosterically controlled? And then of that, say, w in, since you're not really inhibiting the active site, what percentage is sufficiently regulated that your, your methodology would make a difference as a drug? And the last question would be, and then after you screen that in yeast, you still uh, are facing the PKPD issues that will sure. happen in humans, right? So again, what percentage of that you would guess will be the, ag the actual successful compounds? This is where you start flapping your arms hard enough that you're raised to the ceiling of the auditorium. Um, to answer your first question is I have no idea. Um, and, but from our, from our point of view, from a very crass practical point of view, what do we need? We need, we need the, the most important 15. I don't need 1,500. Um, we need, we need therapeutic programs that we can move forward. Um, but how many total cells in, 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 in the, in how many total proteins in a cell are, are, are rated by, regulated by some form of allosteric regulation? My gut, as uh, Gibbs would say, uh, tells me that it's a very high percentage. If you define allosteric regulation not only as three-dimensional structure, but post-translational modification. And I think if you, if you combine those two things together, it's a huge number, it's a vast majority. And what I didn't say here is that, you know, you find the same sort of things. We have programs where you block, uh, there's a process called prenylation that, that puts um, big ugly things on the ends of molecules that helps either transport them or, 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 or lock them into a certain location. And, and you, you'll find inhibitors of that process that are very selective as well. And I forgot the third part of your question. Um. I, I just have, a, I guess, a short question. Uh, if it's a long answer, you can tell me no, over lunch. Won't be. Um, it seems to me that your screen is not specific for allosteric modulators, but it would pick up active site inhibitors as well. And it's the secondary screens that you do that, that differentiate the two. Did I miss something? No, yes and no. Okay. So you got half of it, and you get the other half, because okay. I didn't explain it. Um, of course, in the system, if we, if we look at something like the family of PKCs, right, or all three AKTs, we will find inhibitors of all three. They're pan inhibitors. Those will ine inevitably be catalytic site inhibitors. And if they inhibit, you know, uh, all three mem all members of a family plus an external family, the AKTs plus PKA, um, those have in, uh, almost in depth, almost invariably are, are, are catalytic site inhibitors. If we have, and, and you have to understand, we've we have screen, we've done 
you know, a hundred or so screens at this point. So we have, we have interrogated the library, we have a lot of informatics on the library, we know where the inhibitors are. If we find compounds that inhibit only one strain and none of our other strains, those compounds are invariably inhibitors of allosteric regulation. So it's, you can't do this looking at a single strain. And be best, it's best not done even looking at a couple. Our routine is 11 strains at a time through the, through the library and then look for those selective compounds. And then, in a follow-up screen, absolutely test it. And then, in a, another further step, make sure that when we put it in an animal cell, that's what we think it does. But you will find all of those, yeah. So. Okay, I think it's time for lunch. I'd like to thank John, I'd like to thank all the other speakers and the two people helping with the mics as well.